Good afternoon and welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gillow, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School, Washington University in St. Louis. So happy to have you with us today. Throughout this program, our participants on Zoom are muted. We can't see or hear you, but we really want you to be a part of this conversation. So please use the chat feature uh, to chime in with your questions and comments as we go. Also wanna welcome folks joining us on YouTube and on Twitter. We're glad you're here. We don't have a way of directly um, connecting with you uh, through the presentation though. I wanna thank and acknowledge my co-host and dear friend, Cynthia Williams, our Assistant Dean for Community Partnerships. Cynthia will be helping to moderate the chat, curating your questions, um, and generally hoping to make this an interactive experience for everybody. Before we get started today, I wanna to just let you know a couple things we have coming up. Next week on Tuesday, Dr. Joshua Lewa is uh, providing a program called Mitigating Burnout in the Current Career Space. Um, so as we approach a year and many of us are feeling a little fried, Josh has got some thoughts for us. And then on Thursday, we have a brand new event just added, Thursday the 12th. Dr. Ross Hammond uh, is partnering with Matt Haslam on really cool data science meets epidemiology, talking about modeling COVID-19 containment here in St. Louis. So definitely would love to have you join us for that. But now let's turn our attention to today's program. And it's my great honor to introduce my friend, our speaker. Um, Atia Thurman is the Associate Director of the Clark Fox Policy Institute. Uh, and the Clark Fox Policy Institute is our presenting sponsor for this event. Atia is my fellow Brown School alum uh, with just a really deep knowledge of communications, public engagement, and project management. She is deeply committed to building the capacity of citizens and communities to create positive change and address social justice through policy engagement, which is why she's here today to provide you with an introduction to community organizing. Please welcome Atia. Thank you. Thank you, Janet and Cynthia. That was such a warm welcome. And I'm so pleased to welcome you all to the Brown School's Open Classroom Program. Um, this is Introduction to Community Organizing. So it is the intro. <laughs> Those, I love it if I'm joined by some seasoned organizers who can chime in, but I'm hoping that a lot of you are in the right class <laughs> today. Um, I will be offering an overview of how community organizing can support movement building and change agendas related to social and economic justice and racial equity. And I'll also be sharing, my, like, I'm really excited towards the end of the program to share a, a story of, of local success around community organizing and the effort to improve early childhood education in St. Louis. And at that point, I will um, hopefully be joined by my dear friend and colleague, Joey Saunders, who's Director of Policy and Systems Change at We Power St. Louis. All right, let's do this. Getting started. Okay. Um, there we go. So one of the things I like to start off with is I say community is about people. There we go. And people, places, identities, experiences, values, shared experience, shared um, identities, and shared interests. And organizing is about power. <laughs> and so when we talk about community organizing, we're talking about the power, being able to harness power. I really like this way of community organizing. It's community leaders, um, community organizing enables us to turn the resources we have into the power we need to make the change we want. So what you're looking at is a group of colleagues here um, a couple years ago when we were working on transforming healthcare in Missouri. And it, community organizing puts people at the center of change making and social movements. This, uh, this specific line right here that you're looking at was taken from organizing people, power, and change. It's adapted from the work of Dr. Marshall Gantz of Harvard University, along with um, Leading Change Network and the New Organizing Institute, which is now Wellstone. Some of you may know Dr. Gantz. Um, he has a deep and long history for creating the public narrative framework, which is uh, the story of self, the story of now, and the story of us. He spent many years organizing um, in social justice movements and labor movements. Um, and so, you know, just again, centering people in, in, the, in the power we have to use the resources that we have in order to create the change that we want. And then I really love this. Of course, this is you know someone who uh, I I say is a mentor, um, you know someone I aspire to is is from uh, Stacey Abrams. Her book Our Time Is Now: Power, Purpose, and the Fight for a Fair America. When she talks about 
that the currency of citizenship is power, right? Citizenship is our right to determine our future, our lives, and to change the system when the system creates injustice, harm, or inhibits our ability to thrive. So when redefining civic engagement, we're evolving to organize smarter, faster, better, and participatory leadership is on the rise. Um, the traditional networks of power, uh, the pillars that we, you know, politicians, large organizations and institutions, they still yield a lot of power, but communities of citizens have a real stake in the action and probably more, more so now than ever. And then learning how power operates is key to organizing. Since organizing entails harnessing power, you should consider the power systems and structures that are relevant to your goals and change strategy. I really highly encourage you to look at the TED Talk by Eric Wu, um, who it's the how to understand power. He talks about the six types of power, physical force and control, wealth and economic power, state action and government, social norms, I call it cultural power, ideas, and then civic power, crowds count. And then he talks about the way that power operates and power operates in these three ways, according to him. It's never static and it's like power, it's like water, right? And it moves. And um, later on, we're gonna look at some of the work from Adrian Marie Brown, who actually talks about this as well. And then power compounds. And we all really understand this concept, right? Power begets more power, which is why oftentimes an organizing strategy is about tapping into the power um, and in tapping into sources of power that we're not even always um, aware of. And then power and community, so some observations that we've made over time is that it's highly relational. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about that and that the relationships are really the structure that undergirds so much of power, um, but also organizing. So it's relational, it's often organized by networks. And when I say a network, I'm thinking like by a school by a neighborhood association, by a church or organization. These are these networks, these nodes, visible and non-visible. It's one of, the big, one of the things when you approach organizing is that look for the structural barriers that may be invisible, but that are creating the barriers to accessing power. And then there's, there's this tension, all right? Like we're often in spaces where there's power over and it creates, it sets us up for the win-lose scenario when we're really trying to strive for power with which gets us to collective strength and solidarity and collaboration. So that's just a little crash course in power. This is a little bit about like power will remain, like the powerless will remain powerless. They'll be exploited, discriminated against, marginalized unless, uh, and taken advantage of if they remain isolated and divided. So organizing is really about, again, creating this community, getting us together, getting us, um, to center on a shared goal and vision and so that we can harness our power and make change happen. And then just quickly, if you get a chance, check out, um, later on, I'm gonna try to share some resources in chat. There's a fantastic um, article out right now about the 25% tipping point. Yes Magazine published it. And it really centers on uh, the work by um, Damon Santola around um, how change happens. So he's written this new book that just came out about um, change, how to make big things happen. And he's been studying change, uh, social movements for a long time now. And he talks about the power of networks. And I just wanted to emphasize that because we're talking about power and what we perceive is maybe really typical power, like wealth or being in elected office, right? But citizens hold a lot of power and we hold power in our relationships and the networks that we create. Um, and a little bit about strong ties. So the strong ties piece I wanna say is a, a key facilitator of change in the adaption of new ideas is social reinforcement through social networks. So this is friends, neighbors, colleagues, family, close relationships and redundancy are better indicators than like, like just big numbers and far reach. You need those strong bridges, right? The strong ties that demonstrate trust and intimacy, that's the foundation for cooperation and solidarity. So when you're organizing your champions who want to, who, and you want them to amplify a collective voice, start with your personal networks. It's more important to cultivate stronger ties than many, many shallow ties. And human connection, um, you know, you want to bring in that human connection to move people along levels of engagement from awareness to taking action. This is just something I really love. You know, um, former President Barack Obama has a history of being like, his career history is uh, community organizing. And 
So he, you know, his, his reflections was that community organizing entails working in and with community to solve a problem identified by community. And this is his quote, that organizing teaches us um, as nothing else does, the beauty and strength of everyday people. Um, from that same essay, when he wrote that line, this was from an essay I think he wrote in 1988 <laughs> when he was working in Chicago's far south side and he was a community organizer. Um, and so he, this was an observation he made based on this premise that um, it's not so much that we have a lack of solutions is that we have the lack of power to implement those solutions. And that communities need to build long-term power by organizing resources around a common vision. And that goals are achievable if they're broadly based, if, if a broadly based indigenous leadership can knit together the diverse interests of the local institutions. And so we're talking about um, moving away from a model that was like one or two charismatic leaders who led the way to a very leaderful, leaderful movement. And we'll talk about that a little later. And then also from the same, from the hand, from the handbook organizing uh, people power and change, something that I reckon, if you're in, going into organizing, I highly recommend that resource. It's free and out there on the web. So definitely look into it. And if I get a chance later on, I'll share a link for it. Um, it talks about these five practices, organizing practices. Really important is telling stories, right? Our, our narratives around this. Building relationships is where, um, sort of where I live. That's the lane that I live in, building relationships. Strategizing is what we're actually gonna talk a lot about today, strategizing structuring your teams and then acting, the doing, right? But this is very iterative. So what I wanna say is um, organizing is not linear and it never has been. It requires that we have a lot of patience and persistence and that we adapt over time and change. And so when you're doing this work, you're actually always doing these five things, to be honest. <laughs> and I, want, I just wanna think about um, the writers of this said, this is a framework and it's not a formula. So be fluid, adapt as you go and learn how to embrace the iterative nature of organizing. However, organizing is still process oriented and relational. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about organizing as a process. All right, so there's a lot of times people say, where do we begin, where do we begin? For me, in my grounded in the practice of social work, I wanna begin where the people are, right? And that, that starts with a process of assessing and not assuming. This requires deep and authentic listening engaging, what is the landscape, right? Who's already doing the work? What are the small ones that have happened over time? Um, who, do, like, who do I wanna to listen to? Who else do I wanna to listen to? I, one of the best ways to start is to actually say, who are my people and what are their experiences? You wanna to listen to understand, you wanna listen every time and then you wanna listen over time. Relinquish con preconceived ideas and judgments. I'm going to tell you this right now. Organizing is no place for ego. You have to work hard and diligently at letting ego go and thinking you know what's best, <laughs> okay? Be willing to learn with all the time, to learn with one another, to walk alongside one another. So this really starts with robust listening. Um, and I always say, ask questions, be curious, be more curious than critical. Uh, be attentive and accompany your constituents in their experience. Uh, this could look like conducting one-on-one -on -one meetings, surveys, town hall meetings, neighborhood meetings, social media, mining the data that's already available. But do the, do the work and be diligent in and, um, and assessing and understanding what's really going on. Uh, the second part I would say is, let's see if it works, determine. So next, if, if organization, organizing is a process, then you're going to determine the, spe the specific change that you're advocating for, setting very clear goals, um, sort of everything works backwards from your goal. So be clear about your goal um, and goals can change. Um, and, and one strategic goal does not solve an entire problem or issue. So it's a collection of goals um, over time, uh, but don't be afraid to be focused. The big vision is accomplished through a series of nested goals. And then the last piece of this is planning. So you do wanna plan, act and adapt. What's gonna be your approach? So the next slide, we're gonna talk quickly about approaches. Um, and strategizing. So when you're looking at strategizing, um, you wanna identify your group's power. When I said like, who are my people? What are the experiences? You start thinking about like, what is the group of people that's gonna move this work forward, right? Identify your power and then find specific ways to concentrate it in order to achieve your goals. So when we think about a goal, it's the big, big, bold, broad. I want all of you to think about a goal right now. <laughs> and don't be afraid to put your big goal in the chat, right? Think about a goal that you are working on. Think about an organizing um, or movement building 
process that you're currently a part of. And then you want to start thinking about in strategy. What's the planned approach to take incremental steps towards the goal? Incremental, embrace incremental, embrace iterative, okay? But you also want to ask what path is ripest and ready to move? Is your, you know, and so you're thinking about timing. And then tactics, a lot of us go straight to tactics and that's completely natural. But like a lot of us, when we think about um, addressing an issue, the first place we go is to the tactics, right? We love the tactics, that's the to-do things. But you really need to start with the goal and the strategy and then the tactic, okay? <laughs> so that's where I say like, try to stick in that process a little bit. Um, you're looking for the areas where you can build momentum and which path is, are you most suited to take? So then a little bit about that is, here's a couple of examples. There we go. Here's a couple of examples around uh, overall strategies, right? Is it gonna be political or legislative action? For example, if we need to raise the legal age for adult prosecution, that's, the, that's definitely a legislative action that has to happen, right? Um, is it consumer action, which means can, can could we win by, you know, could we could we get the consumers direct, reach them directly and get them to change a behavior? Then we're looking at let, let legal regulatory action and then disruptive action. So those are just some ex examples of strategies, large large sort of like the larger strategies you might take on. Um, one of the things I want to ask everyone is when you're thinking about your overall approach and strategy, consider whether. Your strategy will operate within existing power structures. For example, getting something on the ballot is operating within an existing power structure. Or will it challenge power structure and relationships, right? Do you need to unseed the way challenge is already operating in order to, um, you know, in order to get your, to reach your goal? All right. So now we're at the tactics part. So I just want to keep in mind that I'm going through this so quickly. Each one of these could have like their own course. So we're just like, this is crash course, right? Introduction. <laughs> uh, tactics. Some of the tactics uh, around electoral power are engaging with your legislators. This is huge. This is building relationships over time. And it, it, a lot of times it's absolutely necessary. I do want to say when you're looking to either build a movement, make a change happen, and organizing for a specific goal, you're going to actually take several different approaches and several different strategies and tactics. And you're gonna experiment. You're gonna think you know what works and then you're gonna to have to adapt. You're gonna, something new is gonna happen. Something's gonna happen in history and it's gonna change the momentum and create a new opportunity. But on, in terms of long-term, long-term is you do wanna build relationships with elected officials and legislators. And our story later about ECE in St. Louis is gonna talk about why that's so key. Um, so this is pictures from a congressional briefing that was held in, I think, 2017 with the Human Trafficking Collaborative Network in Washington, D.C. And somewhere in the middle of that picture is Gary Parker, director of the Clark Fox Policy Institute. Almost everybody there is from St. Louis, and they went and held a congressional briefing. And that's one way of, um, that's one tactic you could use. Attending public hearings, providing testimony, ballot initiatives, these are all part of the electoral power tactic. So this is some of the tactics that maybe a lot of us are familiar with and feel free to like add tactics in the chat. There's no way I could cover all of them. So it's just, again, this very introductory um, way of talking about community organizing. But community engagement and mobilizing the people. This looks like town hall meetings, presentations at community fairs, neighborhood association meetings, schools, faith-based venues. It also entails rallies, marches, protests, demonstrations, and boycotts. I do want to say that a lot of people don't realize how many movements have been built over decades with this, this like intense community engagement. So if you ever get a chance, study how, like why the NRA is so successful, right? The National Rifle Association. Part of why it's so successful is it reaches people very deeply where they are in these very intimate settings, where sometimes the gun control movement takes place in like a, a, a larger space, right? This more abstract space until we have uh, tragic school shootings, and then and then and then it sort of changed a little bit. Um, so just it's always good to look at who's had success. There's some there there have been many movements that have success. Think of and and read their stories. The stories are out there about um, how they were able to to make change happen. I think one of my favorite stories is around marriage equality. And if you don't know, the marriage equality movement 
went on for a long time and there were so many approaches in terms of state legislation, federal legislation. Uh, but one of the big turning points was when they, they did research and they polled and they changed the message from legal right to love. <laughs> and that was a key turning point for them was messaging. We'll talk about that a little later. And then our next set of tactics have to do with communication. So digital, digital engagement, media relations, and a lot of new advocacy tools, web-based and app-based advocacy tools. So this is tapping into organizations, professional associations, faith communities, schools, like all, all the ways that you communicate. Twitter storms, Facebook events, Instagram, peer-to-peer -peer texting, robocalls, printed media, flyers, posters, newsletters. I just recently had someone bring attention, bring to, attention to me just how impactful Lawn signs still are, right? This feels very primitive in today's digital age, lawn signs, but they're actually <laughs> can be really impactful. So if you're campaigning, make sure you get your lawn signs out there. Don't skimp on the printed media. It still has impact. That was a little bit about um, tactics. I'm going to dive into organizing. I mean, the A-list. This is a quick, like, rapid fire reflection of what we just did. The A-list says, here we go. Assess to understand the issues, create, establish a clear agenda, clarify what you aim to achieve. The second thing is what's gonna be your approach and then develop your action plan with appropriate strategies that match your resources with the intentions. Build your alliance. This is the huge part. This is the relationship part that we talked about. Consider unlikely allies, shift your spectrum of allies. Don't discount the private sector either. Uh, they're out there and they're doing some of this work and they have resources. Um, attract attention. So make sure your message is actually inspiring and it resonates with people. And some of this requires maybe a little bit of research about what, you know, how do we frame the message so that it's around like inspiration versus fear. Although I will say fear is such a powerful tactic. Um, but I think for a lot of us who are thinking about authentic organizing, we want to stay away from fear-based campaigns. Um, so. Successful movements don't necessarily overpower the opponents, but they gradually underline uh, undermine their um, argument. So, so understand what your adversaries are saying. Activate your plan. Make clear and easy ask or calls to actions, but also adapt. And we're going to talk more about our case study uh, and where we had to adapt. Um, organizing is activism and it takes practice. Practice, practice, practice. You know what I say? Start in your family. Start in a small way. If you're new to organizing, test your skills out, but you do need to practice. Some of you who have children, some of you who have um, maybe are teachers in a classroom, uh, maybe you're on a team at work, think about organizing within that small space, right? Maybe um, you want to organize for a small change. Um, maybe your children want to organize for what snacks and movies you watch on Friday night, family night, but <laughs> start noticing organizing where it happens and start practicing it. I want to say a couple of really key things quickly about leadership and equity wins. This is so key right now. I cannot overemphasize how we think about structuring our teams, how we think about approaching the work. Um, so I can't say everything I want to say here, but I, you know, honestly, I'd like to believe that most organizing by nature is inclusive, but it is not. You have to be intentional. A great example of this was when the first Women's March was organized, it was mostly led by white women. And there was, and then and there was not the intentional bringing in women of color voices into the organizing around the Women's March. And so that was a lesson learned. Um, and, and, the, and, the, and that lesson was brought to public <laughs> very quickly. Um, leadership has to look like more than just having people sign on to your work, it's truly shared. So you're creating the agenda together and it really should you know, center the people who are most impacted or the voices who are most proximate to the problem or the issue. And then you want to harness the power of many. So be inclusive, be leaderful. Um, again, deviate from this idea of like one or two charismatic leaders. There's so many types of leaders. Think about leading alongside of or behind, um, but be creative in thinking. Um, be like, be creative in regards to who you invite to the table, uh, work, you know, what the approaches you're going to take and think beyond the usual suspects. Um, consider unexpected opportunities and allies. And again, I'm going to say this just one more time, put the ego aside. Like if it's something you have to like put on a sticky note and put on your computer, this is not a space for protecting turf. <laughs> this is a space to be inclusive. It feels it's going to challenge you, but it's necessary. 
Um, and I also want to say, if you get a chance, read, uh, listen to Leslie Crutchfield, the author of How Change Happens, Why Some Social Movements Succeed While Others Don't. And she talks about leaderful movements, share three traits. They empower local, roots, local grassroots leaders to step forward. They are built around coalitions of like-minded and unusual suspects. And they are filled with people who have a lived experience of the problem and are empowered to speak and act. Really quickly, you're going to counter a resistance. That's the anytime we're asking for change, there is friction. All right, let's just say it. There's going to be friction, we're going to be ready for it. <laughs> okay, one of the ways to be ready for it is identify the source of resistance. Some people say there's three types of nodes not now, not that, not ever. <laughs> if you can understand the source of your resistance, then you can understand what tactics or strategies or approach in terms of countering resistance would work well. Um, it could be that there's different interests. There could be um, vastly different values. There could be a misalignment between the party and the policy that's being proposed. It could be that it's miscommunication or misunderstanding. Like right now, I feel like there's a ton of misunderstanding around defund the police, and people don't really understand what is being asked for when we talk about defund the police. So if you understand the source of resistance, then you understand how to counter it. I do want to say be willing to compromise, but know the boundaries with which you will not compromise. It, it takes both. And then uh, here's also where I want to say inspiration. Inspiration is actually a real way to counter resistance. Um, again, I'm going to use the, the movement for uh, marriage equality. And when they, when they changed their messaging from like, it's the rights of people to love is love, that became um, a rally cry. And it really helped move, uh, the, move that, move that uh, change over that finish line, right? Not that it's fully over the finish line, but some big wins have happened. Ask yourself, is your goal to persuade? And I can't, I want to credit who said this. I just watched a video recently with um, Dr. Marshall Gantz and, and two other people. And one of the other speakers, he actually asked this question, which I really love because I don't think people ask this enough. He said, is the engine of your movement love? So deeply embedded somewhere is be clear about what is it that, who is it that we love, what change will bring to their lives out of love, out of compassion or companionship. Um, sometimes we can't move people on the rights on what, like what we think they deserve, but we can move them on empathy. Empathy is still a very real human <laughs> um, characteristic. All right, quickly, I just wanna say along the process, right, along the path, you may feel like you didn't get a win. If you didn't get a legislative, you know, if you didn't win, uh, you may be saying we lost. No, I love this thing. Stacey Abrams says, because I learned long ago that winning doesn't always mean you get the prize. Sometimes you get progress and that counts. So I really like what um, Erica Chinowith says about uh, the process goals, right? Are we expanding participation, forging new alliances, impacting levels of support? You know, these are all things that are happening along the path to success. Don't discredit them. They're really key in terms of the movement work and organizing. And I just wanna say that because sometimes we get discouraged and we shouldn't let that happen. Transformation doesn't happen in a linear way. Um, so we can't always track uh, and measure wins, but when you see this happening, progress is happening and that's really important. And then last, I wanna leave you, before we go into our case study, I just wanna leave you with uh, right now, of course, one of my favorite authors and she's actually gonna be presenting to St. Louis, actually, you know, to anybody and everybody on the Zoom space, but the Education Equity Center of St. Louis has brought Adrienne Marie Brown. She will be speaking next week. This is an open event, so you can um, sign up and join us, and I'm really excited and thankful to the Education Equity Center of St. Louis um, for doing that, but she's, uh, Adrienne Marie Brown has written several books now. This is from, I think, Emergent Strategy. Mm -hmm. And I just want you to take this in because I feel like it's very poetic and we need to be mindful of these things. Um, she starts this quote off just to be fair with saying, the crisis is everywhere, massive, massive, massive. And we are small, but emergence notices the way small actions and connections create complex systems, patterns that become ecosystems in society. Emergence is our inheritance as part of this universe. It is how we change. Emergent strategy is how we intentionally change in ways that grow our capacity to embody the just and liberated worlds we long for. 
So she's a poet and she's an organizer and she's so many other things, an author, a women's rights activist, a black feminist. If you get a chance, I say pick up her book um, and, and get a group of people and organize a book club. <laughs> How about that? That's a great, that's a great thing to organize. So before we move into our case study, which I'm so excited about, I'm just going to quickly check the chat. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. Excellent. Okay. Just want to take a quick look okay. and see some of these questions I'll try to answer towards the end. All right. Fantastic. So this is the point where I get to introduce Joey Saunders. <laughs> Joey, are you there? I Yay! am. <laughs> I can't see myself, which is unfortunate <laughs> because I enjoy looking at myself. Oh, there I am. Yay. I'm like <laughs> I a baby. This. I love it. <laughs> exactly. We need that. So Joey, if it's okay, I have a few slides that I will just kind of power through. And then what I'd love for you to do is to add to the story and talk about things that I'm going to leave out because I want to hear your voice. So I just want to reintroduce Joey again. He's, he's representing us today from We Power, but we were part of a group of people who have been working um, for a while about improving early childhood care and education in St. Louis. Um, and so this is part of the story about a, a very important recent campaign and a recent win that happened for us. Just to give you, again, a lay of the land, a lot of assessment happened over the years. A lot of assessment happened. The big picture uh, that we came away from was there's a lack of access when you think about, and honestly, I can't even imagine how this may have been impacted by COVID. We do know that child care and early childhood education has been um, significantly and profoundly impacted by COVID. Uh, so this was all pre-COVID, okay? This assessment, pre-COVID, we looked at a, a, a system that was underfunded in many ways. If you don't understand, I, I just say, I challenge you to understand um, how maybe as a parent, you've paid for child care and it feels very expensive but it's still not enough to meet the needs of childcare providers. And there's, there's a whole sort of, I think it's actually pretty simple. The care of human beings is intensive and takes a lot. <laughs> and for our children to have high quality care, it's, it's we need resources. And parents actually cannot bear that burden on their own, right? Um, so the costs were too high, there's lack of access. And then we had racial inequities replicated throughout the system in many ways, both in terms of who has access to quality care and also who was delivering childcare services and um, our ability to support them. Did I miss anything, Joey? Okay. Just quickly, there's a huge story, like a lot went into understanding the landscape. This is just four reports I'm sharing. It goes much further back than this, but I wanted to emphasize that our understanding of what was needed was definitely data-driven. And it was also evidence-based. So the Clark Fox Policy Institute did the report launching lifelong success that looked at, so what is the evidence? There's a ton of evidence at this point for why the investment in early childhood education is so critical. Education benefits, health outcomes, economic prosperity over the life course. Okay. And then there was a collaborative. So out of out of, there was a lot happening. There was councils uh, that had been years in the making and doing the work and laying the groundwork. Um, and then the first, to, first Step to Equity Collaborative came together and had some priorities. And many, and many of those priorities are, have moved along successfully. And this, was, um, this represented a range of stakeholders and a, and a strong collaborative movement. Um, I, I think it's a great example of collaboration because we really we're embracing sort of like some radical collaboration. And then this is the part I want Joey to talk about because this is the part that I'm so excited about. So I'm gonna turn it over to Joey to talk about We Power and the incredible work that they did. Sure, um, thanks for having me. I'm Joey Saunders. I'm the Director of Policy and Systems Change for We Power. Um, it is a social startup in St. Louis that's dedicated to redesigning unjust systems uh, so that they are just and equitable for all. Uh, one of the pieces of We Power is the Tomorrow Builders Fellowship, um, which really, on top of feeling like power is a human right, which some people, whenever they hear that, feel like that's kind of like a radical thing to say, which is, I think, sort of, sort of uh, a baffling but 
for a lot more people, I think it's a very inspiring thing to say um, and has been a very attractive force. And so whenever we just sort of put it out into the world that we wanted to reimagine and redesign the early childhood education system by centering those who were most affected by inequities, particularly racial inequity in the system, um, we had a number of applicants and then selected 14 fellows that became kind of a core group of community members that were either parents or teachers or center directors that really uh, became the heart of this work. So leading with those who are particularly most affected uh, was just the, the foundation and the cornerstone of this. And then they went out and spoke with over a thousand community members to gather what their dreams of change were. And I think you alluded to that earlier when you were talking about the need to sort of surface exactly what issues are most important to people. Because uh, otherwise, if you just sort of say, I think this is the right direction to go in um, because we need to act quickly and you're looking for a shortcut or whatever, then um, I think you're going to find that it's going to be a lot more difficult to, to find buy-in with any sort of issue going forward. So really, once these community members came together and we were able to create a shared vision and set of values, we engaged in a participatory policymaking process over the course of a few months that became um, a playbook, which was a, an, an actionable policy recommendation document um, uh, that has 17 solutions uh, that ideally will be implemented over the next several years. But there were a few that were seen as 2020 priorities um, that were kind of alluded to back in the slide with the um, transitional collaborative and one of those was to increase public funding. Um, what's this one? Yeah. And so one of those was to oh, go ahead. Yeah. So some of the some of the high level recommendations that came out of the process and in multiple multiple reports was that access and funding increased access to sustainable public investment, prioritize the allocation of funding to children in high need areas and then the system coordination. And so I will move this to this because I think it led to this, right, Joey? One of the one of the 17 calls to action in the playbook. Right, the funding and access piece, um, uh, one of them was just to establish local public funding streams dedicated to early childhood education. Um, so then there was a push to actually uh, have a ballot initiative. And what we ended up doing was uh, there was a push in the county for a half cent sales tax and then in the city to increase um, a, a property tax that had already existed uh, through the mental health board. And so those became the two uh, kind of two pronged strategies that we were really going to see as priorities. Uh, and this was really right before the pandemic hit. So then there was a kind of, I don't know if you have a slide for this or not, but a piece of organizing that became um, about just getting emergency stabilizing funds from the CARES Act that wasn't included in the playbook, but was also another triumph that we were able to secure um, uh, seven and a half million initially in CARES Act funding in the city and county, uh, at now nine and a half million. And then um, the Thank other- Thank you so much for saying that. This is, I think it's so key to talk about adopting. So you can push through a strategy, but you cannot be deaf to what's happening. Of course, we couldn't, um, like when COVID happened, we all got together and it was like, there's a new immediate need, right? We have a long-term goal and these strategies in place, but the new pressing an immediate need is this. And yeah, so organizing around getting that immediate COVID funding was really impactful. Thank you for saying that because I didn't make a slide about it. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Um, uh, as far as this half cent uh, sales tax goes, the another thing 
is that uh, we had originally wanted to go through a signature gathering process to get onto the ballot. And we spent a day signature gathering and gathered 10% of the signatures that we needed in one day. And then like right afterwards was when uh, it, it became very clear that folks needed to quarantine, that um, we needed to, to reassess uh, how we were going to go about trying to get on the ballot. And that's why there was a pivot towards um, engaging uh, existing relationships with elected officials. So when it became clear that um, the ordinance language wasn't quite the way that we wanted it in the county, we shifted focus to um, put all of our capacity around what was uh, possible in the city. And what we did was not just finding uh, a friendly sponsor in Alderwoman Shamim Clark Hubbard uh, to sponsor what would eventually become Proposition R, but we also made sure to activate our existing community leaders uh, like Cortega Collins and Rochelle B and Gloria Nolan, who's the campaign coordinator for Prop R and was one of the original Tomorrow Builder Fellows, um, to really use their stories and their public narratives to move the alders uh, to put this on the ballot. And it's really one of the only things that was unanimously uh, approved by the Board of Aldermen, uh, as you know, can be a very contentious group of folks, but, but really decided this is something we need to put to the vote um, for the people. And then several of them ended up uh, endorsing it along with other uh, state and US Congress folks. Yeah, and I wanna say that Prop R, so much of it was led by the base, by the, those impacted. Um, it was led by, it, it was very grassroots. It was a lot, it was, I, I mean, I'm so proud. It was so many black women who are mothers, caregivers, and the educators who are leading early childhood, um, the, pr the provision of it, they were providers. Um, there's so many we can't even name, like honestly. Um, and then there were more than 40 campaign endorsements. Um, St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the Louis American came out and endorsed it. Um, who really, uh, there was, I would love to call it a groundswell. Um, and we really did think a couple of things happened along the way. And this is the last slide I'll share because Joey will appreciate this. Um, it's the, the slide I call like uh, uh -oh, the, the behind the scenes, right? It was my way of saying like so much went into this <laughs> and I couldn't even cover it all here. There was a point where we had to, um, Oh, I mean, we had to make our case in the county, and 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 there was a point where, uh, well, I won't say we, but the the camp, the organizers were making the case in the county, and um, had to deal with misinformation in a really like, if for a minute, I will be honest, it was kind of disempowering almost for a minute, but that didn't last long because we had momentum and we had a lot of other things on our side, and we weren't going to let, um, you know, we weren't going to let misinformation stop us. But do you want to talk about that at all? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the, the most important thing to realize is as um, voices are in a way democratized on social media, it becomes a bit of a double-edged sword, right? You, you absolutely should think about the way that you are organizing in a world that's becoming increasingly digital. And you have to be really careful about the fact that um, the same kind of conduits of power, you know, organized money, organized people, organized uh, folks in positions of influence tend to be the same way that you can concentrate uh, a message or a movement online. So we were hearing a lot of loud voices uh, that were spreading misinformation online in a way that could have been very discouraging. However, because we had such a strong commitment to canvassing and door knocking, done very safely, made sure that everybody was wearing masks and was getting um, their temperatures taken uh, beforehand and we had our checklists and everything and we're staying the right amount of feet away from folks while we were having conversations out in the community. But it was 
so crucial to remember, like, at the end of the day, there might have been six or seven kind of Twitter trolls that were saying this or that about what was going on. But then when you would go out in the community, uh, you just had such an overwhelming amount of support. Um, and when people weren't supportive, they usually just had questions and needed those questions answered. So anytime somebody would feel like they needed to respond to something online or um, were getting discouraged and wanted to uh, engage in like a, a comment battle or something like that, mm -hmm. we would just say, step away from your computer right. and uh, knock on doors. So uh, that was really uh, absolutely something that I think it was crucial to lift when you're, you're talking about uh, misinformation in the digital age. Yeah. I do want to clarify that m my involvement in the work was personal, very personal. So as um, in terms of um, just to distinguish, Clark Fox Policy Institute produced a report that, that, that showcased the evidence for why early childhood education, high quality early childhood education and care is so critical. Anything related to the campaign was personal involvement, just to be clear. <laughs> so I just wanna make that delineation. We have, I think, like 13 minutes left. Is that right? So if it's okay, we'll move into questions. And honestly, if it's okay, I will turn off the PowerPoint at this point and stop share. Did it work? Okay, great. Absolutely. All right, fantastic. So um, Joey and I would love to have a conversation now with the people who are out here. So even though you can't take yourself off of mute, um, we're going to look out for your comments in the chat and see if there's any specific questions. Also, I would love to look at the participant list and give a shout out because I think there's some people in here who um, are intimately familiar and part of the work that the case study that we just presented. So if, if you yeah, were, put yourself Vanessa, in the chat, please. Vanessa at least is on the call and she did a lot of phone banking um, for it and was another one of the tomorrow builders. I know she's on here. I know Charlene's on here, who's um, our vice president of, of movement building for We oh. Power. Um, yeah, and Charlene is like a rock star organizer. So just so you all know, this was like intro to organizing. Charlene is like pro, pro organizing to the point where if Charlene's on here, I need her to tell me in the chat what is this thing she's doing now at, like, at Harvard, right? She's gonna, I'm like, what is that? I, I read about it, so I just want to make sure I get it right. I'll try to look it up. Atia, in the meantime, as, I, as that response comes through, would you mind answering the question, what does, when ego gets in the way, what does that look like? What have you experienced? Can you give the audience an example without identifying opportunities and people I understand, but I think people would really appreciate uh, a description of what ego looks like when it gets in the way and who tells the person or people that you're territorial or ego bound. Oh, wow. That's, uh, and Joey can chime in as well. And Janet actually has a background in organizing. I can talk about this. What I've seen sometimes that ego get in the way is also someone who's not conscious or not aware of their power and the positionality of power that it gives them. And so they, um, they may not be listening authentically to people to, to, to the input that's being given on how to drive a strategy or an approach. They may, not, they may not be listening to the problem and they continue to make assumptions. And if you're in a position of power, your ego can, anybody's ego, you don't have to be in a position of power, but it can, it can shade how you take in information and the decisions you're making. And you really do need a close ally who's able to say like, snap that rubber band, right? And say, hey, <laughs> um, I hear you, but you're also coming across in a way that it seems like you're really driven by maybe some self-serving motivation, or you're not listening to constructive input and you're being defensive in your response. And this isn't about you. This isn't personal. And sometimes in, organize, in organizing and movement building, it becomes very personal. We're brought into it for personal reasons. We sacrifice a lot to be part of it. So it does start feeling very personal. But the thing about movement building is it's about many. It's about many, many, many. <laughs> and um, so, Joey, if you have any examples that you want to talk about, but um, we do have people who feel very turf oriented and, and they actually stop being inclusive. There's a point where they, um, 
they don't even take on resources of other humans and other ideas because there's a turf of like, I own this turf. I've, you know, I've been doing this for so long. Um, and that's what I mean by like the ego part or check your privilege, that type of stuff. Yeah, I, I think a good example would be um, recently, I guess I was uh, asked for thoughts on like a, a process of people who kind of wanted to learn from what we were doing with the Tamar Builders Fellowship and wanted to kind of replicate it to a certain degree um, somewhere else and just uh, was essentially asking, okay, how do we do what you did, but we already kind of know the policies that we want to implement. We just want community members to come in afterwards and support all of them, <laughs> sort of like that. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and I think that's pretty common um, is for folks to, to be, you know, from a foundation or um, have a specific policy agenda and then just expect people to show up for it because it's like evidence-based or whatever else. And I think that's great, but um, I mean, I think it's great to have subject matter experts and use, you know, empirically vetted policies. Mm -hmm. But if you don't engage community members in the design process or in surfacing exactly what they care about, there is no like shortcut to actually um, getting folks on board and feeling passionate about fighting for something um, without knowing that it's already deeply and widely felt. That's, someone just asked a question um, about indigenous. I'm gonna try to find it because I really appreciated it. A recommendation, Suzanne, thank you. She said, what recommendations, and I think this speaks to what Joey was just saying, what we're just saying. What recommendations would you give for a group of leaders indigenous to a region that have lots of experience leading their organization who may have the chance to lead a large systems change program? Suggestions for gaining training with such larger systems change leadership. Oh, there's a really great um, resource that I'll try to find around systems change. Um, if you are, there's another tension here. There's a lot of tensions in organizing. We just talked about one just now almost is the ego and, and power and, and sharing. And another tension in organizing is um, sometimes when we stay small, we stay authentic. And, and when it's time to scale up, there's a fear of losing some of that authenticity, right? Um, but at the same time, I like to say, embrace the scaling up if the process feels, if the process is inclusive, if the process um, lends itself to systems change, then then be, it's, it's the tension of, do I operate within the existing power structure or do I try to like mm -hmm. unearth the power structures because they've created injustice and imbalance. And, and sometimes that tension is an odd place to be, right? So I, I don't know if Suzanne's in that tension, but she's talking about specific suggestions for system change leadership. I'm gonna share something in the chat and maybe that will help Suzanne. I'm just looking forward. Uh, Joey, there's a question for you too. Could you speak more to the resistance you received specifically, how you had to make compromises to move forward? Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think, I, I guess like we could have compromised more to move things forward in the county and been okay with the way that the ordinance language was, but ultimately decided uh, against doing that. So in that case, we did not make a compromise uh, with the, the language that we wanted. And I think that you know, the compromise I suppose we made there was to say, okay, this isn't necessarily the right time for us. So we'll need to, to wait until it's safe to do like either a robust signature gathering campaign or to re-engage with community members to design a uh, ballot language that we feel comfortable with. Uh, and then in the city, uh, I really, um, I don't know that I, have specific things that I would say we we compromised with. I think it was more just like pivoting to the the world being quarantined. Mm -hmm. You know, like that was more of of our 
focus. Uh, that would be that would be what I would say. But there are definitely I think pragmatism sometimes can be an underrated value, and I know that that's not necessarily something that everyone always always feels. But there there certainly are times when, especially if you're engaging um, a broad group of people or elected officials like you have to be realistic about what we kind of call the the world as it is versus the world as it should be mm -hmm. and figuring out how to bridge those two realities right because people aren't just driven by altruism as much as that would be storybook lovely um their self-interests to to consider um so it was a good question and i wish i had a more thorough answer there's definitely a, oh, definitely the approach in the city was about adapting. Like I will say the approach in the city was really a great example of adaptation. Um, you have no idea a pandemic is going to come and that you can't collect signatures and that your state does not allow you to collect signatures digitally or online. Um, and, and if that's the way you get a ballot initiative, then it's like, what's the other way? Can we go that way? And it worked out. <laughs> There's a question from Carol, and there's a consensus about how great this presentation information provided. Carol's question is this, using the defund the police as an example, when do you keep trying to explain what you mean by your message versus shifting the phrase so that people relate to it more easily? Oh, wow, man, you just put us on the spot with another one of those tensions, right? Um, so I think we, I, I, I want to repeat this example because one of the examples, again, was marriage equality. And the tact for so long had been to go through the, the electoral legislative route um, and to, to frame it as rights, right? So, so um, fighting for a right. And then changing the language so that the language, the communication strategy, the change to love is love became about not so much rights, but people being able to identify and messaging and social change. So then it was like, instead of like trying to change the law, we changed people's, how people felt about this actually. And then that helped to change the law. <laughs> so that's such a great question. Um, with defund the police. Say, I think, yeah. oh, Go I ahead, think Joey. Yeah. Like, I think like language norming is so important. Like just figuring out and defining everything for your uh, your core supporters, because I don't know that everyone in the defund the police camp would agree that they don't mean like full stop defund the police. Um, and then there are other people who are like, well, when I say defund the police, I really mean reallocate arrest and incarceration resources to, um, you know, trauma informed policing or um, to education or to all these other different resources that could be considered public safety but mm -hmm. just aren't arrest and incarceration. And I, I think there is still a conversation being had there. So I, I guess, yeah, I, we focus more on like education and economic justice. So mm -hmm. I, I don't have as much necessarily expertise here, but uh, that's kind of my, my inkling on it. We yeah. have such rich questions that remain and we only have one minute left. So I'm going to punt it to both of you to give your closing remarks with regard to this presentation and how you would like certain uh, uh, elements of your presentation to land with your audience. I'll start with mm. you, uh, Atiyah. What would you like to leave with your audience? Oh, really? I want to leave you with love. <laughs> I would like the message to land with love. Mm -hmm. I feel a lot of love that you're here, that if you're interested in organizing, it means there's something, someone that you're passionate about. Organizing, I said community is about people organizing about power, but it's all about people. And it's all about um, some change that needs to happen in order to um, undo an injustice, uh, to improve lives, to move us forward toward um, a liberated future, right? And so I wanted to land with love. If we said something that you're not sure about, organizing isn't perfect. It never has been, it never will be. <laughs> right. So um, you'll need to interpret it as you will. But I hope that you are being powered by the engine of love to do the work you're doing, that you're sustaining it, that you're persistent, um, and that you continuously recognizing the power you each individually hold. But the value for the collective power is just incredible. So keep building those relationships. Don't give up. Thank you. I'll see you, Joey. 
You have the last word? Yeah. My last word would be uh, when in doubt, do one-on-ones. So that's uh, <laughs> one of many Mac-isms. So from Charlene Mack on our team, and uh, mm -hmm. I think she probably learned it from from someone else as well. So it's a kind of axiom of community organizing that is centered in uh, relationship building, uh, and hopefully that blossoms into a kind of love. But just whenever you feel stuck, I feel like a good thing to do would be to ground yourself in just having a 30 minute conversation with somebody where you surface their, their values and their story without it being transactional, which just takes the stress off of, of the situation. And then if you want to follow up with that person, that's fine. But for the one-on-one, -on -one, it should just be really about connecting and surfacing those shared values. Thank you. Oh, I love that. That's so great. Thank you, Joey. <laughs> And Janet, it's to you. Thank you both so much for sharing your time and your expertise. Thank you to this audience. I hope you're seeing the, the love and appreciation for you in the chat. Um, this has been a wonderful hour we've spent together. Uh, so thank you both so much uh, to my wonderful co-host, Cynthia. Thank you for leading the Q&A as always. Appreciate it. And um, to the audience, thanks for being here. We hope to see you soon at another open classroom. Please stay healthy and safe out there. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.